Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome back to the start of the Quake Core seminar series for 2023. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this morning uh, Regan Chenramohan, who's uh, both a colleague at uh, the University of Canterbury and, and just a few doors down from uh, me in terms of offices as well. Uh, Regan has been uh, at the University of Canterbury for I think about six years, maybe seven years. Um, he completed his uh, PhD at Stanford University, working with uh, Jack Baker and Greg Dearline. Uh, and as the topic of his uh, seminar suggests, his main uh, research areas of interest are structural analysis and, and dynamics. So um, I won't uh, take the punchline of his title. I'll just pass over to him. So Regan, look forward to hearing from your talk. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions to answer afterwards. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Brandon. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in on Friday morning. Um, my name is Regan Chandra Mohan, and I am faculty over here at the University of Canterbury. And uh, as Brendan mentioned, my primary area of expertise is structural analysis and seismic hazard and risk assessment. Um, the topic of my presentation today, well, is going to be on the recent advances in seismic design and the performance assessment of structures. So I'm going to talk briefly about, well, the history of structural analysis, um, how we got where, to where we are today. Uh, well, where are we at today in terms of uh, seismic design assessment practice and where might we head to uh, in the future, sort of extrapolating from our current trajectory over the last few decades. Okay, so I'll dive right into it. Well, considering there's a fair number of you, which I was uh, anticipating, who aren't structural engineers, it's always fun to give presentations like this to folks who aren't structural engineers, because we, we talk to structural engineers on a fairly regular basis. And uh, I thought I'd introduce this, uh, have a brief introduction slide over here, just talking to you about what seismic design form assessment really are. I mean, you probably have heard structural engineers uh, utter these terms on a rather regular basis, but I thought I'd just break it down for you all. Okay, so, well, what is seismic design? Well, seismic design essentially is a stepwise process that is responsible for deciding, well, what structural elements span from which area to which area within a structure, and what are the cross sections or how deep or fat or squat those cross sections need to be to ensure that they can withstand the seismic loads that are imposed on them over the life of the building. Okay, so to conduct seismic design, the first thing you need is you need a sort of preliminary estimate of the geometry of the building. So for example, if you were to design the Salesforce Tower uh, in uh, San Francisco or redesign it because it's already there, first thing you need to start with is a basic idea of the geometry of the structure, where the columns and beams are spanning from and to. And you'd also need an initial guess of what the section sizes might be because it's sort of an iterative process. Once you have that initial estimate, you then go about developing what I'd call an idealized numerical model of that structure on a computer. And then you would go ahead and characterize the seismic loads that this building is likely to experience over its entire life. So if the lifespan of this building is estimated to be about 50 years, well, you would conduct a probabilistic assessment of, well, how large an earthquake might uh, occur around the site. What is the nature of the ground shaking that the site might experience? How strong, how long might the ground motions be? And then what you would do is you would analyze that idealized structural model under those ground motions, and you would try and estimate from that analysis what the individual forces on each structural member are, what the deformations induced in each structural member are under those earthquake ground motions. And then you would compare those demands uh, imposed on those structural members against the capacity of those structural members to withstand those demands. And if the capacity turns out to be lower or not sufficiently higher than the imposed demands, then you would conduct a few iterations. You would then make the section stronger or weaker as an accessory and redo this process until every member safely withstands the uh, loads that are expected to be imposed on it. So that's about structural design. Now, assessment is something uh, similar, but not entirely the same. Now, assessment is something that's performed on structures that already exist. If you already have a structure, maybe something that was built in the 70s. And today, if you would like to estimate, well, is this structure still fit for purpose, you would conduct a, a, a process called assessment. And the steps involved in assessment are typically 
very similar to design. For example, you would still have to develop an idealized structural model. You would still have to characterize the seismic loads that might be imposed on it. And you would still have to analyze the structural model uh, under those seismic loads. However, there would be no designing of the structural members. All you would do is based on the analysis results, you would sort of gauge what the performance of the structure is. Is it fit for purpose? Is it expected to withstand the seismic loads that might be imposed on it, or is it not? And if it's not, well, there might be some remediation efforts that might be necessary, like uh, maybe adding a few braces or some kind of uh, remediation that might be needed. All right, so that's seismic design and performance assessment. Now, well, as you probably noticed, structural analysis features rather prominently in both those uh, procedures. So, well, structural analysis is something we kind of take for granted these days. Um, we have computers that can do it for us, but I mean, we haven't had computers do it for us for a really long time. So I thought I'd just talk briefly about the history of, well, structural analysis and how we came to this point where we were able to, at, pretty much at the, uh, on, our, on our fingertips, be able to conduct any kind of analysis by the push of a button. All right. It started actually uh, quite a few hundred years ago in 1676. It started with Robert Hooke, who postulated that stress is proportional to strain, right? So he essentially said if you apply a force P on a member, the displacement of that member is essentially proportional, proportional to the force, and that constant of proportionality was what he called the stiffness K. And it all started from there. Uh, about a decade later, Sir so Isaac Newton developed the equation of motion where he took the same uh, equation. KU is equal to P, but he said now the force can be time varying. That is, it can be a dynamic force. And if you have a dynamic force, you need to add that uh, inertia term, which is the mass times the acceleration. And that was the original equation of motion. And in 1690, Sir Isaac Newton and Joseph Raphson developed an iterative method to solve that equation of motion for nonlinear systems. And that is the method that we commonly known now as the newton raphson method, which is pretty much ubiquitously employed to solve that equation of motion. And that actually stayed the uh, state of the art for about at least two centuries since. Uh, and in 1877, uh, Lord Rayleigh developed that concept of damping, which again uh, is commonly used in analysis these days. And he added that third term, the C times the velocity, which is essentially, essentially responsible for the dissipation of energy that we observe in our structural models. And that is the same equation of motion we solve even today to simulate the response of structures. In 1942, uh, Courant described, well, the basis, he developed the foundation of the finite element method, and things pretty much exploded from there. Uh, in 1956, uh, Turner, Clough, Martin, and Top, they took what Courant had done, and they developed the entire basis, the entire finite element method as we know it today. And after that, in the 1960s, the first computer-based structural analysis programs uh, started to be developed, and these programs employed the direct stiffness method of analysis, which is essentially a method of linear analysis. In the 1970s, well, analyses that used to be done manually using methods like moment distribution and the method developed by Muto from Japan, well, those started being replaced by computer-based structural analysis programs like, well, SAP, Romoko developed over here at the University of Canterbury, others like Drain 2D, ETABs, and ANSR. Okay. Now, these programs were designed and developed to run on these massive mainframe computers because we didn't really have desktop PCs back then. And if you wanted to conduct any kind of structural analysis, well, you kind of needed access to one of these huge and expensive uh, computers. And therefore, use of these programs is mostly constrained to well, academic use and folks who had access to uh, big computers like that. In the 90s, 80s, though, well, desktop computers came into the scene and stuff just exploded even further. Now, in every structural design office, uh, you could have one or more desktop computers. And so these structural analyses could now be performed in every design office for relatively cheap. And in the 2000s, we started moving on from linear analysis to nonlinear analysis. So a lot of these commercial packages actually started adding nonlinear analysis routines, and those started uh, increasing in popularity. But mostly it was the advent of computers uh, that really kickstarted the use of structural analysis for design and assessment. So here is some uh, data taken from uh, Trevor Kelly's paper in 2004, 
Uh, he, here he shows a schematic of a model of a 37 story building that was developed in well the 1980s. And that's a model that contains about 1,600 elements. Well, in the grand scheme of things, today that is not considered a relatively big model, but back in the 1980s, that was a humongous model. And in 1985, conducting a nonlinear analysis on that structural model took about 30 hours on a super mini computer that cost $250,000. Okay. And the amount of time it took, well, you can see in that uh, bar graph right at the bottom over there, uh, it took 1,800 minutes, 30 hours. If you fast forward back uh, forward in time, in 2003, about when this paper was published, that same analysis, nonlinear analysis, took less than a minute to run on a $3,000 desktop computer. Right? That shows you the strides that, uh, well, the advances in com computational technology that uh, have sort of transpire from 85 to 2003. And going from 2003 to 2023, so two decades down the line, we can now run that same analysis in just a few seconds. And we can't just run one of them, we can run about eight of them on even a $1,000 laptop because a $1,000 laptop usually comes with about eight cores per CPU and each core is capable of running each of these analyses in a few seconds. So although the speed of each individual processor hasn't increased dramatically, we now have a number of processors that are capable of running a, a computation simultaneously. And this is only going to get uh, better and better as we move down uh, in, well, into the 30s and the 40s. So here's where we're at right now. And because of this widespread use of numerical simulations today, well, there are a number of issues that have sort of come to the fore with uh, the ubiquitous availability of finite element software because currently anyone can get their hands on a, on a structural analysis software and conduct a analysis and make any kind of inferences they choose to from those results. It is, however, really important, uh, I guess, to, to, rem to remind ourselves that at the end of the day, all of these structural analyses are simulations conducted using idealized models of real structures. They don't actually represent those real structures. And as the famous statistician, George Box said, well, all models are wrong. So the results that you get from your simulation are 100% guaranteed to be wrong. The, the probability of it being equal to the exact uh, response of the structure are practically zero. And well, well you, you might ask then, well, what is the value of conducting the simulations if you know from the outset that it's wrong. Well, as George Bock himself said, despite all structural models being wrong, some of them are actually useful. So although you may not get the exact response of the structure from your model, well, you might be able to infer features of your structure. Inform, uh, it might inform you about, well, modes of response, modes of failure, which help you gain some insight into the actual dynamic characteristics of the real structure, which is what we're here really using these models for, right? So it's, you gotta take the predictive capabilities of these models with a grain of salt. All right, uh, now that we sort of have a brief, vague idea of how we got to where we are, well, what are, well, I'm just gonna spend the next few slides talking about what are the recent advances that have uh, taken place in this area. And that will then lead me to, well, where we might go from here into the future. All right, so recent advances, uh, I say advances in the field, but there's mostly work done by, well, myself and my research group over here. Well, one area that we have focused on is, well, characterizing seismic loads. As I mentioned, it's really important for us to know, well, what types of earthquake ground motions uh, might be experienced at a site. And frankly, until now, uh, over the last maybe five to six decades, ground motions at a site have been characterized primarily by the response spectrum. Now, the response spectrum is something that you see plotted in the top left corner, and that response spectrum typically characterizes the intensity of the ground motion, that is how strong the shaking is, and the frequency content of the ground motion, that is uh, how, how's the energy in that ground motion distributed over different bands of frequencies from right from the low frequencies to the high frequencies. Now, that is all well and good. And in fact, lots of studies have shown that, well, response spectra actually are very strongly correlated to structural response. 
Well, recent research has shown that the duration of ground motion also influences structural response. That is, it's not, it doesn't only just matter how strong the shaking is, it also matters how long that shaking uh, lasts for, which if you think about it, it kind of makes intuitive sense. It kind of makes sense that the longer the structure moves back and forth for, well, you'd expect your strength of the structure and stiffness of the structure to deteriorate within each cycle. And you'd expect the duration of shaking to have some kind of uh, response, some kind of effect on the structure. But again, most of our numerical models used until maybe a few decades ago were really simplistic. They weren't able to capture the cyclic degradation in the structural uh, characteristics. And so most studies showed that duration doesn't have an effect. But more recent ones conducted over the last decade or so have actually quantified this effect of duration and shown that duration does actually influence structural collapse capacity. And uh, my research group, well, we uh, demonstrated this, as you can see over here, and this collapse, what we call collapse fragility curves, show that depending on whether you're using a set of long duration ground motions or a set of short duration ground motions, you actually compute distinctly different structural capacities. And the capacity under long duration shaking is markedly lower than that under short duration shaking. Well, that again imposes a bit of a problem. Well, if the structures are weaker under long duration shaking, well, then that probably needs to be considered in the seismic design process. So we've actually developed a method to incorporate duration in the current seismic design process by adjusting what we call the design base shield of the structures. So in places that are likely to experience long duration ground motion, well, we ramp up the design base shear so they are inherently designed a bit uh, stronger. And that sort of compensates for that uh, long duration effect. We also developed an alternative, alternative method to consider duration in seismic design, and this is by adjusting the seismic design drift limits. So here, well, we start out by recognizing that ground motion duration affects not just the collapse capacity of the structure, but also the deformation capacity of the structure. Um, if you look at these plots on the left, you have what we call IDA curves. And if you follow that blue IDA curve, well, what that plots is on the y-axis, we have ground motion intensity. So as you keep scaling the same ground motion up and up and up to higher and higher intensity levels, and under each ground motion intensity, if you simulate the response of a structure, well, you can see that the peak story drift ratio, the peak deformations also gradually increase until at some point at one intensity, the ground motion causes structural collapse. And that's indicated by the horizontal line by really large deformations being observed at that intensity. And marked with an asterisk, you see what we call the deformation capacity or the dynamic deformation capacity of the structure, which represents the largest deformations that structure can withstand before collapse. Now the blue IDA curve corresponds to a short duration ground motion, and that red IDA curve corresponds to a long duration ground motion. And you can see that on average, the peak deformation a structure can experience before collapsing is markedly smaller under long duration ground motions. Or in other words, the deformation capacity of the structure is lower under those long duration ground motions. And you can see on the right hand side, I have duration plotted on the x axis and that dynamic deformation capacity plotted on the y axis. And you can see over here the dynamic deformation capacity computed under a large number of short and long duration ground motions. And you can see that there is a very distinct decreasing trend. And the slope of that uh, trend line is, well, it can be exploited to decrease the peak design drifts permitted in the structure at the design stage based on the duration of the ground motions that are anticipated at the site. So this is another method that we developed by which you can uh, incorporate this effect of duration in the design process. So that's about characterizing seismic loads. Um, Moving on, uh, incorporating the cyclic degradation effect in our structural model we found was key to actually capture this effect of uh, duration. Now, this is easier to do in a certain class of models and more difficult to do in another class of models. Plastic hinge models can capture the cyclic degradation rather easily. And that is because this is what we call a phenomenological model, that is, they don't exactly represent physics, but you are able to sort of assign a macro scale, assign macro scale physics to the model to try and simulate various phenomena without modeling their underlying features. 
And therefore, these plastic hinge models were predominantly used in the studies of ground motion duration. There are a more advanced class of models known as fiber element models, which actually simulate the real physical behavior of uh, beams and columns. Now, the problem is, since you're simulating real physics, it's really hard to simulate these modes of deterioration. For example, in a reinforced concrete column, that could represent crushing of concrete, buckling of rebar, some slip between the rebar and the concrete. Uh, so those kind of small, minute phenomena become pretty hard to capture. So what we've done is we've taken this uh, Tripathi et al., a reinforced, reinforcing bar model. So this is a model developed by Mayank Tripathi in, uh, in super, under the supervision of Rajesh Thakal over here at the University of Canterbury. And this uh, reinforcing bar model is actually capable of phenomenologically capturing the low cycle fatigue and inelastic buckling behavior of these rebars. So we've actually taken this uh, mathematical model and implemented it in open seas. Now, this is work currently being done by another PhD student over here called Janan Mo, and he has implemented this buckling model in open seas, and he's actually validated this model against experimental data. And he is now working on assessing the impact that these failure modes he's now able to simulate in these reinforced concrete frame structures on the capacity of these RC frame structures. So we are now going to see how using a more sophisticated numerical model might potentially change the results that uh, we derived previously using this plus uh, slightly uh, less uh, sophisticated plastic hinge models. So this is again work in progress uh, at the moment. Another uh, direction that we're sort of uh, pushing the frontiers at is in mitigating numerical non-convergence. Now for the structural engineers in this room, I mean, any one of you who conduct, conducted any kind of nonlinear structural analysis or even nonlinear geotechnical analysis for the geotechs in the room, uh, you've most definitely encountered non-convergence unless you uh, manage to stay away from implicit schemes uh, all throughout, which is uh, rather rare. And this issue of non-convergence is something that uh, sort of plagues any structural analyst. And it's very annoying to have to deal with because it is often purely a numerical artifact that leads to an abrupt sort of end of the analysis before you're able to simulate the response under an entire ground motion. And once you encounter numerical non-convergence at a specific time step, it's really hard to proceed. The co well, the common heuristic uh, methods are that are employed to overcome numerical non-convergence when you encounter it, sort of usually adopt the shotgun approach which entails sort of tossing a whole bunch of uh, tricks at the computer, trying to sort of coax it to converge. For example, people might try reducing the analysis time step, playing around with the uh, convergence uh, tolerance, trying different solution algorithms and so forth. And if nothing works, well, they usually just give up and say that, well, we've encountered collapse, that structure has collapsed. But Again, research conducted recently has shown that that is usually not the case when non-convergence occurs. It doesn't usually imply that the structure has collapsed and assuming the structure has collapsed actually leads to uh, improper inferences about the behavior of the structure. So, well, this uh, direction of research is mostly born out of frustration, I guess, on my part in terms of having to deal with this problem time and time again. So we actually set out trying to understand the root cause of numerical non-convergence in normally dynamic analysis. And this is work currently being done by a PhD student called uh, Nicholas Morris uh, within our group. And what he has done is he has started out by looking at inelastic SDOF systems. Well, so these are the simplest types of nonlinear models that uh, we usually analyze. And he conducted a large millions of simulations of, non, of these inelastic SDF systems. And he sort of isolated the cases where non-convergence was actually observed. And he then dug much deeper to find out what was causing that non-convergence. And what he found out was, well, the source of non-convergence was the storage limitations of floating point numbers in the computer's memory. Now we know that Computers cannot represent uh, irrational numbers up to infinite uh, decimal digits that they actually use a finite number of bits to store computers and the rounding and truncation that occurs each time an operation is performed leads to uh, non convergence at times. So essentially what he was seeing was well I have over here on the top left, uh, the equation to compute what we call the residual force at each iteration 
R represents a residual force. And on the right-hand side, you have all the terms that, rep that appear in the equation of motion when you use the Newmark's average acceleration scheme. So the iterative method that is used to uh, find a solution to this equation at every time step, well, it converges to a solution if that residual force can be reduced to zero. Well, again, because we're dealing with computers, it can never ever converge to zero, but look, as long as the residual force comes down to a really, really small number, you can say, all right, my analysis conversion, you can move on. Sometimes what happens is, if you look at this figure in the middle, uh, on the x-axis, well, we have displacements, and on the y-axis, you have the residual force. So ideally, you want to find the point where that imaginary line passing through those dots intersects with the x-axis. Unfortunately, since displacements can only be represented by a finite set of floating point numbers, sometimes the tolerance has been set to such a small value that no displacement number actually corresponds to a residual force that is lower than that tolerance. So your analysis sort of just gets stuck in a loop between those two points that are as close as possible to the zero, and it just keeps cycling. And that is what we found most commonly leads to non-convergence. There are other cases which I'm not going to uh, get deep, uh, deeper into, like the case on the right-hand side where actually a solution exists. As you can see, there's a point that exists between those two bounds, but the analysis actually keeps uh, sort of jumping between two other points that are on either side of it. But bottom line, the root cause is this truncation and rounding, rounding that occurs at each iteration. And some other insights that we found in the, into this convergence problem was the fact that decreasing the analysis time step was actually exacerbates this convergence issue, which is actually contrary to popular belief because most people think that decreasing the time step, well, makes your analysis more accurate. Well, yes, that is to a certain degree after which the numerical uh, artifacts take over and it actually exacerbates the problem. So ideally you don't want your delta T to be too small. You don't want to be too large either. When it's too large, again, you have, uh, you have accuracy uh, that takes a hit. All right, and finally we developed a procedure to choose an appropriate tolerance for your analysis to completely eliminate this uh, issue of non-convergence, at least for SDOF systems. And future work is gonna aim to sort of uh, extend this towards MDOF systems. All right, uh, this again is work being done by a student, uh, Saiteja Sisla, on the risk target and size of design of buffering restrained braced frames. And this uh, re, uh, line of research was motivated by the fact that there are currently no clear links between the acceptance criteria that are prescribed in seismic design codes and the overarching performance objectives that are uh, mentioned in the commentary to the code and the uh, building act. So for example, when I say acceptance criteria, I mean stuff like, well, what is the peak deformation that is permitted in the building at what we call the ultimate limit state? What are the peak forces that are uh, permitted in our force? force control structural members. Now, these prescriptive guidelines aren't really linked to the overarching objectives that talk about, well, what is the rate of fatalities a code conforming building should have? On average, how freak, how, what is the likelihood of it collapsing in 50 years? What is the likelihood of it injuring or killing somebody? There isn't really a link between these uh, two items. So risk targeted seismic design uh, framework sort of were born to sort of fill this gap. It, so these risk target design frameworks essentially enable us to design a structure that explicitly meets a specific target performance objective. So it's sort of, you can perceive it as a design method that is somewhere above the code prescribed minimum that helps us more clearly quantify what the performance of that building will be. Now, we decided to focus on uh, developing a risk targeted seismic design framework only for buckling restrained brace frames because, well, frankly, at least in Christchurch, since the Canterbury earthquakes, almost the 50, um, well, firstly, we're not building any new reinforced concrete buildings. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, we're building almost entirely steel frames because of the big hit that the concrete buildings took in Christchurch. And nearly 50% of the new steel buildings coming up all contain buckling restrained brace frames. And as you can see, there's a photograph for Rutherford building containing those big bright buckling restraint braces. So what we started out to do was firstly develop a really robust and sophisticated model that is capable of capturing all of the failure modes, these BRBFs 
or buckling restraint brace frames might undergo. And one of the most important ones that, that have been highlighted by other faculty over here, as you see, uh, other faculty including Greg McRae and Chin Long Lee, is this failure mode that's related to the out of plane buckling of the buckling restraint braces. Now, most concurrent modeling techniques that are used by, in research, they don't capture this out of plane uh, buckling failure mode. Most of the models that have been developed to capture this failure mode have been very uh, detailed continuum finite element models. So we set out developing a macro model uh, that you can see uh, illustrated here in the schematic that is capable of capturing this out of plane uh, failure mode. And this incorporates, well, adding, well, this includes adding small elements near the end that characterize the actual uh, cross section of those gusset plates and end, and end zones and also adding small out of plane imperfections. So, so that'd be into the plane of the screen and out of the plane of the screen. So that when you have an axial force in the brace, it actually enables that brace to buckle out of plane in the model. So we developed this uh, macro model of the buckling restraint braces and we validated the model against uh, component level experimental tests conducted in the laboratory by other faculty at UC. Once we did that, well, we then have currently set out to quantify the effect that this uh, failure mode has on global building performance. So most other studies that have been conducted until now have focused on those component and assembly level uh, simulations. So we're going to look at what happens at in the at the building level when you incorporate this uh, failure mode. How uh, do you actually see and expect these uh, braces to buckle out of plane under realistic earthquake scenarios? Uh, and finally. We're going to create a suite of BRBF building designs, and we're going to model each of them, and we're going to sort of study their performance and look at which parameters control their performance. And we're going to try and back calculate if we're going to want to achieve a certain performance, how do we have to design that BRBF to go ahead and achieve it? And that'll be that risk target design uh, framework that I mentioned. And sort of just to close things up, the path forward as as you can see, we've come a long way from the rudimentary types of analyses we were able to perform in the 60s and 70s, from linear analyses to nonlinear analyses, and now to nonlinear dynamic analyses, and moving forward, again, just extrapolating from where we've come over the last uh, decade or so, uh, at least the way I see it, although structural analysts these days are required to make a number of uh, small scale uh, decisions when they create their uh, structural models. In the future, they may not have to do so. Uh, I think automated model development and an automated analysis is actually not too far away, where, where the analyst may be required to only make broad brush uh, decisions like what type of elements do they want to use, what type of modeling assumptions do they want to use, and the computer would sort of, you know, uh, meet them halfway and help them develop a model uh, to, uh, well, that meets all of those criteria that have been laid out. And, well, it remains to be seen uh, how many how many structural analyst jobs uh, this might end up taking if this is entirely automated. Uh, but again, uh, that's in the future. It's really hard to predict. But Another thing that might happen is we might soon be able to conduct larger number of simulations in parallel. Currently, parallel computing isn't very uh, well exploited by structural analysts. As you can see uh, on the left over here, I have uh, a, a typical representation of Moore's law, which states that, well, the number of transistors that can go into a computer chip kind of approximately doubles every two years. So computational capabilities empirically have been doubling every second year and extrapolating a bit into the future. Well, we're not too far away before we might easily be able to conduct tens or hundreds of analyses on a simple desktop computer simultaneously. So this could be conducting analyses using large numbers of ground motion simultaneously or the same ground motion under large numbers of uh, types of, of variants of your structural model. Which leads me to the next point about conducting or explicitly considering model uncertainty in our structural analysis using Monte Carlo simulation. Current practice, we typically analyze one structural model using a large number of ground motions. Um, that is definitely better than analyzing one ground one 
structured under one ground motion. So we are accounting for that record to record variability from the ground motions, but we're not really accounting for the model uncertainty. In the future, we might be able to sort of use Monte Carlo simulation to come up with a number of realizations of our structural model, and we might be able to analyze them under large numbers of ground motions as well to get a good grip on what is the actual total uncertainty inherent in our analysis results. And we should be able to use that to make more and better informed decisions uh, regarding the acceptability of those results. And again, this is just my vision of what we might expect to see over the next uh, few years or decades. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of my presentation. Well, thanks a lot for your time. Wonderful. Thanks, Regan, for taking us through uh, both the history as well as uh, your thoughts on the present and future.